Ravi has been in the Agile industry for over 25 years. Uh, he's an Agile coach with Org Whisperers, and uh, he has worked with organizations anywhere between 10 and 10,000 people. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Ravi, I'm going to thank you for being here today and turn it over to you. All right. Thank you. I'm a really old person. Uh, I'm, uh, I finished 26 years in the IT industry. And I've been in the Agile space for a long time. I have made more mistakes than all of you combined. And that is a gift that keeps on giving. It's a very generous gift. It's not showing any signs of slowing down. It seems to be getting faster as I age. So what I'm going to be doing today is I will be vulnerable uh, in service of you. You've given me the gift of your time. And I want to, if my failures, my cringe-worthy failures, can help you avoid some suffering in your life, my life is well lived. So my goal today is to be vulnerable with you, not try to be a know-it-all, and try to use my failures in service of your happiness. So that's my promise to you. Let me share my screen. Do a quick tech check. Are you seeing a title slide which says I got fired? Yeah, okay. Uh, please talk to me. Uh, I hate the sound of my own voice. It's a necessary evil. So I would love to listen to you. Interrupt me as often. My acceptance criteria is to deliver value. I'm a big boy. I can handle it. If your question is disruptive, I'll ask you to park it. Okay. Uh, let's talk about Resumex. So Resumex is uh, the, it's a company where uh, I'm currently helping out. This is a client and a partner of mine. What we are doing is we are trying to use chat GPT to accelerate the process of taking a product, a release, or a feature from idea to delivery. I was very skeptical of ChatGPT because I, two reasons, I was worried that it will replace uh, human ingenuity. And the second is ChatGPT is very confidently wrong. Like it delivers all kinds of BS. But it, there are things that it does which are super cool. So I'm delivering courseware uh, for this company. If you are curious about how to use ChatGPT, in, inside your product development, um, talk to me. I would love to invite you to one of our upcoming courses. Two other things I want you to know about me. I'm a very grateful immigrant to America. I have so much gratitude for this beautiful country. Uh, the way I'm trying to pay back to this beautiful country is through a nonprofit called Agile for Patriots, where I give free training to US military veterans and spouses. Our 11th cohort is coming up next year. If you can help me by donating or considering our graduates as candidates, uh, doing mock interviews, uh, internship, anything, I will be grateful for your support. And if anything I say resonates with you, I'm a small business owner. I do agile transformation, coaching, consulting with all whisperers. Uh, I would love the opportunity to help your company or the gift of your referral. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, let me cut to the chase and let me talk about why you are here. The mission of my life is to disrupt the needless destruction of human potential. Life is short. And the message I hear from God, universe, belief system is, Ravi, there's somebody out there who's struggling. They are my children. Go help them. That's why I'm here now. Chances are you're here because you have some problem. And it's quite possible that I have a solution. And that's, that's why I do what I do. So my goal is to disrupt the needless potent, uh, disruption, uh, destruction of human potential. And there's a lot of it going on in the name of Agile and Scrum. So that's my current focus. I have a question for you. Why are you here? You can speak up. You can type in the chat window. That will give me context to deliver value to you. Self edification. Thank you, William. Connection. Thank you, Diana. What's the burning question that brought you here? Curious. Learning, networking, learning from my mistakes. Okay. 
trying not to get fired. <laughs> Knowledge gain. Have the courage to disrupt BS. All right. Very good. Cool. Thank you for giving me the gift of your answers. I mean, rough to go against execs. Why you have been dogmatic? Very cool. All right. So thank you for telling me a little bit. Cut the clutter. All right. Tell me what do you need from me so that this is a good use of your time. In India, we call it full pasa vasul. So if there are some Indians, they will understand what I mean, right? <laughs> full pasa vasul. Like you, you pay money to go and watch a movie. At the end, when you come out, your friends will ask you, was it pasa vasul? Did you get your money's worth? I want to give you your money's worth. What do you need from me? What do you need from each other? By the way, you can talk. I won't bite. Is a virtual call. Reality. Thank you, Jamie. Michael wants reality. Thank you, Michael. What do the others want? Value from history. Okay. Real life experience. Thank you, Asim. So, Ravi, like uh, I would also like to know most of the company are now moving, like they don't want Scrum Masters, right? So, uh, currently, I means I'm working as a technical program manager slash Scrum Master. So, what should we do in our career to still relevant and and uh, help others? Got it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ajay. Yeah, and I think this. The topic of today's session is very closely related to the backlash that we are seeing in the industry where there is a perception and I, I, I would say that's a valid perception that Agile and Scrum are not delivering value. So let's fire everybody. Let's fire Agile coaches, Scrum masters. So I'm hoping that today I will give you some techniques that I am learning from the school of my hard knocks where I have not delivered the value that clients hired me for in the hope that it will give you some tools to add to your toolkit. Thank you so much. All right, uh, Yusuf, mentoring, Minakshi, why industries hate the mention of Agile, and Michael, not wanting Scrum Masters. All right, very good, thank you. So I have some ideas about what you want, why you're here. If you haven't turned on your camera, if you're comfortable, if you don't have any privacy issues, I will be very grateful if you turn on your camera because I feed off the energy of people. I'm here to serve people and it's easy for me to see what's landing, what's not landing because I weave that into the dance that we are about to dance together. And please talk to me, speak up. For example, Michael's here for reality and if I'm not keeping it real, Michael, speak up. Hey man, that's BS. Keep it real, man. So talk to me. Okay, uh, so there are lots of reasons why I got fired uh, for being dogmatic. And there are uh, the adjustments I am making fall into two categories. There are things that happen beneath the surface and that there are things that happen above the surface. Time permitting, I want to give you my playbook of both. Okay, so I will give you 10 plays that I'm using for my inner work because what's going on inside of me and who I am being is a leading indicator for what I am doing and what I am getting. So a lot of times, human nature is such that when we are not getting what we want, we start asking ourselves, what do I do different? What certification do I get? Very rarely do we look inside ourselves and ask, who am I being? Who do I need to be? So the bulk of this conversation is going to be beneath the surface. Who am I being? When I make a shift in my inner world, miraculously, there is a shift in the outer world. And then the second part of this conversation is going to be operational, which is there are some practices that I have started incorporating in terms of uh, interacting with my prospects and clients. 
So I will give you 10 plays for inner work, 10 plays for outer work. And hopefully by the time all is said and done, you'll have at least one new plane that you can take, all right? So lots of reasons why I get fired. Here are top 10, my top 10 list. First is my agenda. So client hires me, Ravi, we want to be agile. I'm like, awesome. And I have an agenda. Oh my God, it's gonna be so awesome. Agile manifesto, agile principles, we're gonna do this. And your life is gonna be fantastic. And now I'm off to the races. I see this beautiful vision of, of how their company is going to be amazing. We're going to follow every value in the Agile Manifesto and every principle in the Agile Principles. And it's going to be awesome, man. And then my ethical moral compass is I am going to honor my values. I have some non-negotiable values. How do you know what your values are? I learned something from the Coactive Training Institute. There's a very good acceptance criteria. It's like behavior-driven development. You know, in BDD, when the test fails, it goes red. And the test passes, it goes green. When you're living your life, your body is the test. When your value is being honored, you will feel it in your body. You will feel excitement. You will feel joy. I feel joy here. I'm feeling it right now. When your value is dishonored, something tightens up. For me, I feel tension here. I feel tension in my stomach. My arms start tingling. So when a client hires me, my agenda is I am going to make you the most agile company I can. I'm going to help you realize the vision that I have for you. And I'm going to make sure that in this journey that we're traveling together, I will never violate any of my values. And when my body tightens up, I'm going to adjust so that my values are not being stomped on. And my ultimate focus is what I said to you at the beginning, that, hey, God, universe, somebody sent this beautiful bunch of people to me and God gave me a sacred duty. Ravi, these are my children. They are suffering. Go help them. And when all is said and done, I'm going to have a final sprint review with the maker. And I don't want to flood that sprint review. And God is going to ask me, dude, I sent you my kids. Did you take care of them? And I want to be able to say, you know what? I messed up a lot, but I promise you I gave it everything I got. I don't want to flunk that sprint review. Right? So that's my sacred duty. That's how I behave. And if you've had the fortune or misfortune of working with me, the reputation I have in the industry is this guy can be difficult to work with, but he's a very ethical guy. Okay? So that's a reputation I have for better or worse. So I hold myself accountable every night. I can't go to sleep. If I look back at the day that I have spent and I'm asking myself, Ravi, did you do the best you could for your clients? Did you leave them better at five o'clock than you found them at nine o'clock? Did you plant some seeds that will bear fruit and help them long after you're gone? That's my sprint review, daily sprint review that I have. So that's what keeps me focused. Did I do that? And then there are things that triggered me. One of my triggers is when I feel that management is not being kind to the team. And very often in the agile industry, and maybe this is why we are, there's a backlash. We have misused, let me not say we, let me take personal responsibility. I have misused management as a pinata, where I project my, my biases about management, who by the way, are God's children like all of us. And I project my biases on them. Hey, these are command and control, waterfall, traditional management people. They don't want to trust and support the team. So it's very often that there is a certain archetype of a manager or an executive who triggers me. And then I start getting uncomfortable and that creates choppiness or turbulence in our relationship. And when that happens, I'm not able to course correct and I get fired. Okay, so that is reason number six. Now, what is my go-to mask? So when you're in an airplane and there's turbulence, you're supposed to reach for your oxygen, right? Oxygen mask. When I'm in a relationship, personal, professional, especially with it, if it is with an archetypical executive who is typically a male who triggers me, I become very rigid and dogmatic. That is my go-to. It's not helpful, but when something that I deeply care about is threatened, this is my not so helpful response to protect something that precious that is being threatened. And I go into, 
agile manifesto, agile principles, scrum guide. But no, this is what the scrum guide says, right? I become dogmatic. When I get dogmatic, they get dogmatic. And it's like two kids who get locked into a very unhealthy cycle. They both came into this relationship with good intentions. They wanted to make their company better. But then I got triggered, they get triggered, and it's a very rapid descent to the bottom. And what makes my heart dance is I want to see my clients succeed. So the reason I engaged is my hypothesis is, hey, they are stuck somewhere. Something is stopping them from living their most joyful life, from delivering awesome products to customers and their users. And I may have a new perspective that I can share. And when I see my clients get that aha moment and live at the next level, man, that's the best, best damn energy drink in the whole world. So that's what I'm using. And there are times when I see my clients being demoralized. And man, that sucks the joy out of my life. And sometimes I'm not able to see that. And then I am liable, I'm likely to, to blame the executives. And then I get triggered. They get triggered by me. Okay, Ravi, we're done with you. Sometimes uh, my clients have a different interpretation of what ethical behavior is. And when I see that, uh, I stand for my ethics, and then there's a clash. And the clients are like, no, dude, you're, be, come on, man, this is, don't be so idealistic. We are, we're in the real world. So this is how we do things here. And I'm like, okay, either they fired me or I fired them. And finally, there are times when I can sense in my body that we're not having fun together. We started this relationship with some expectations that, you know, we work together. We are going to deliver more value to our customers, to our users, investors, communities. But you know what? We took it for a test drive. It's like a user story. A user story is a hypothesis. All user stories are suspect until proven otherwise by the market. So you have a hypothesis. You know what? I think customers going to like it. Users going to like it. You deploy it to production. Customers like, bullshit, man. This is the worst thing. Nobody ever uses that feature. Okay, no problem. That's one of the agile principles. We're going to reflect. We're going to tune. We're going to adapt. The same thing can happen with relationships. You get into a relationship. Both parties go in with good intentions. Take it for a test drive. Like, yeah, not feeling it, man. Okay, no problem. Time to move on. There are times when I don't listen to this. I keep trying to make lemonade out of a lemon that's dry. I don't move on. And when you don't move on, when you're supposed to move on, the client will make you move on. All right? So these are the top 10 reasons why I get fired. I'm curious. Talk to me. Which of these resonates? Which of these are you curious about? I have a simple question to us. Uh, yes. May? Yes, yes. Please uh, when ahead. you say, uh, when you join a company, you have a vision, but a vision is created between two people or between an uh, understanding. So how you can go somewhere with your understanding, it's, it's always a collaboration to have a vision to work together. So if you have a vision and it's not aligned with the people, we already done the mistake on day one. So I'm sorry uh, if you say it in this way. It's, uh, it's a bit, bit surprising to join somewhere where the vision is not aligned. Uh, it's, it's the road we were to, as I'll always say, talk, create a vision, and then start something. So aren't we uh, already uh, doing the mistake there, going with your own vision? Absolutely. That's the biggest mistake. Coaching is supposed to be a dance where it's the client's agenda, not the coach's agenda. So that is the biggest mistake. And in the coming slide, I'll give you the 10 antidotes to these 10 reasons. But I'm that's sorry to say that. That is, no, no, that, that's why I'm here. That's, that's one of the biggest mistakes. It's not about my agenda. It's about the client's agenda. So that is the biggest mistake. You hit the nail on the head. I did not see who was speaking because there are a lot of- I, I've seen here and thank I you. See. Sorry, I'm sitting with my daughter. I cannot switch on my video. No, no, that's fine. Um, thank you so much, Asim. That's the biggest mistake. And like I said, I'm not the, uh, I'm not the sharpest crayon in the box. <laughs> so I made some pretty stupid mistakes where others are like, dude, come on, you did that. But that's why I'm here. In case someone else is about to make the same mistake, I want to share very generously 
from my cringe worthy mistakes. Who else? Uh, it would help me. There are a lot of comments coming through. So it would really help me if you did what Asim did and just spoke up. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I definitely, this is Diana. And I definitely think that, that my turbulence and my oxygen mask are the ones that always get to me because I feel like if, if I'm being attacked as not, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. Oh yeah. I get right on that high horse. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We all have our triggers. And I'm going a little bit into psychology, but there's something that I learned from Coactive Training Institute and from ORSC, uh, Systems Coaching. There is a, a one, one view is uh, we all have frozen parts inside us. So this is from uh, internal family systems. So when we were kids, something bad happened. Let's say for me, how if somebody accuses me of doing something unethical or not knowing my shit, I get triggered. So what happened was maybe some when, when I was a child, somebody accused me of not knowing my shit. And in that time, I, I did not know how to handle it. But a new patch was installed on my program which said, Ravi, in the future, if someone accuses you of not knowing your shit, I am going to come in and take over. So what happens is my triggered self takes over. The code is hijacked. What's happening is I'm 50 years old, but the guy who took over is someone who's trying to protect maybe a five-year-old child. Maybe this is too much psychology, but a lot of the dysfunction we are seeing in the industry or we, wo we work through every day is because of inner stuff. Okay, so Diana, thank you for sharing. All right, uh, chances are you're not here for the problem, you're here for the solution. So I'm gonna give you my top 10 playbook for the inner work and along the way, Please speak up if something resonates or doesn't resonate. So here are my, here's my agenda. Here are the changes I'm making. So as Asim says, before I get into an engagement, this could be in the interview process if you are uh, a full-time employee, or this could be in the pre-sales process if you are a consultant, which is screw Ravi's agenda. Coaching is not about Ravi's agenda. Coaching is about the client's agenda, like Asim said. So ask the client, hey, what do you want? And they say, oh, we want to be agile. Okay, what does that look like to you? What does success look like? Talk to me. It's not about just my values or your values. If we are going to do this dance together, we need to build a relationship which honors our values. So tell me, what are your non-negotiable values? And I would like to tell you what are my non-negotiable values. And then we'll see if they're compatible. Let's work together. If not, life is short. Let's move on. I am not sure how many scrum masters who apply for a job have the guts to have this conversation in the interview. I have personally worked with scrum masters who have applied for jobs which are shouting from the rooftop that this is a project management job. We want on time, on scope, on budget delivery. Now we might couch it as a scrum master job, but it's shouting from the rooftops. Guys, we don't want a freaking scrum master, but the, the, the candidate will not listen to the sign. You go to the interview and people are saying, no, you will create a status report. You're going to make sure we're on time, on scope, on budget, and you're going to hold the developers accountable. The signs are flashing, but people don't see what they don't want to see. You get into a job, you are demoralized, you'll get fired, right? So have the guts to be clear about your non-negotiables in the interview process. What do you need? So. I might be holding myself to a standard that my client doesn't want me to hold myself to. So ask the client, whether it's a pre-sales or it's a job interview, hey, tell me, what do you think is my duty to you? What do you need from me? And I'm introducing a technique or an approach from the world of systems coaching. In systems coaching from CRR Global from ORSC, what they say is the job of a systems coach is to number one, be a mirror to the system, reveal the system to itself, reveal the company, the scrum team, stakeholders to themselves. Number two, see if there can be some alignment. We may disagree about 95% of things, but can we align on 5% of the things? Can we take action in the next sprint, two weeks? And can I, as their systems coach, over increase overall positivity? So if you are a systems coach who believes in the CRR global ORSC view of systems coaching, this is your job. 
reveal the system to itself, help the system find alignment, help the system take action and increase overall positivity. That's it. That's your job. So I was trying to hold myself to a standard which was an unrealistic standard. So ask your client, what do you think is my duty to you? Also, it's a two-way dance. Coaching is a relationship, is a partnership between the clients and the coach. You hold me accountable, I hold you accountable. I'm not your servant, I'm not your mom, I'm not your nanny, I'm not your consultant, I'm your coach. Which means there will be times when I gotta challenge you, I gotta hold you accountable, I gotta call you on your BS. And I'm a flawed human being, you gotta call me on my BS. How the heck are we gonna call each other on our BS? Let's talk about it. And what's gonna make things turbulent for us? When you have worked with other coaches or scrum masters or, or people in the past, What's made things difficult for you? I'll tell you what's made things difficult for me. And let's see if this turbulence pops up in our relationship, how might we handle it? What's gonna be our oxygen mask? How will we know that we're not having fun? We're just not feeling it, man. It's time to move on. What are we never gonna compromise on? And finally, when it's time to move on, how are we gonna move on? So you build the exit ramp of your relationship before you get onto the freeway. Right? So these are the 10 plays that I am trying. Some of them are inner work, some of them are outer work. What I wanna do is, I wanna ask you what resonates, what do you wanna talk about? If you want, you can type, but remember that I probably won't be able to respond. It'll be better if you speak up. What resonates, what doesn't? Hey, I see that there is a question here in the chat that we may want to address. Karen has asked, why don't we learn to recognize and better respond to our triggers and the triggers of others? Thank you, Karen. And it's nice to see you. We've exchanged messages on meetup. I think. Yeah. Powerful question. What do others think? I want to tap into the wisdom of the crowds. <clears throat> what do you think about Karen's question? I'll start, I guess. You know, things like um, nonviolent communication. I don't know if people have been familiar with this and it's really just learning how to talk to each other so, so that we can hopefully limit the amount of triggers we're causing through the way that we speak to people. Yeah, thank you, Jamie. Ange? I think it was Ange. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. yeah I just found, um, not thinking about it from a scrum master, just as a general employee that we're, we're more reporting to managers who are not coaches. Um, so they, it's easy for them to just point out that you're doing something wrong, but they're not really equipped to help you and guide you through to, you know, in this case, you know, figuring out what the triggers are and how to move on and, and, and what to do in that situation. I actually wrote down a bunch of notes that said, Hey, I got to actually you know, write that down. Um, I was one too that um, on the last slide, um, triggers are really what 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 get me. Um, so I think you know having those coaches around um, really help you move on from that. Yeah. Thank Plus, it's both. just it's hard. Yeah. It's hard to learn how to yeah both read other people's triggers and be cognizant of your own triggers. Those are those those both take ongoing work, right? Yeah. I share my perspective. Um, for me, the most dangerous place in the world is the inside of my mind when I have to face my fears. And I'll tell you why, let's say if I look in the mirror and I look at Karen's question and I personalize it. So if I say to myself, Ravi, uh, I'm looking for Karen's question. It was here somewhere. Ah, yes. Why don't I, Ravi, why don't you learn to recognize and better respond to your triggers? The answer is it's so damn scary. There are issues, I'm 50 years old. There are issues I've been struggling with for 30 years. It's so scary for me to go to those dark places. And it's so easy for me to blame someone else because that blame protects me from facing something I've been resisting facing for so damn long. So what is my antidote? I work with a coach. I eat my own dog food. Every two weeks, I work with a coach who's the kindest person. I, you know, he's the kind of person I need. 
with his support, I am able to go into dark places where I could not go alone. And I install a small patch every two weeks, just like you release some user story to production and you see if it works or not. Every two weeks I work with my coach and I deploy some, I get an insight, I deploy an adjustment to this. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. But just like you don't stop going to the gym, which by the way, I don't go to the gym, I should. <laughs> but I go to the mental gym. Uh, it's a never, never ending journey. So Karen, that's my answer to my to the your question. I don't know the answer for everyone on this call, but I can only speak from my lived experience about why do I struggle, which is it's too damn scary. And the only way I have found success is through the help of someone caring and compassionate, my coach who calls me on my BS and helps me be a better person. All right, great question. I think in addition to triggers, there are also you know, hundreds of biases that are come, you know, that we, we aren't even aware of, right? That that we have. And, and so we're learning to recognize those also helps a lot. Yeah. Thank you, Jamie. And I saw one question, what kind of coach would that be? Well, I um I would recommend the Coactive Training Institute, or it doesn't matter. Ask around, hey, I'm I want to get to the next level of my life. I'm looking for a coach. Who do you think I should talk to? Ask 10 people you trust. They will tell you. But if you ask me, go to the Coactive Training Institute, find a list of coaches, have chemistry sessions with five of them, hire one. Okay, I wanna move on. I wanna talk about, so all of this conversation was beneath the surface. This was about inner work. Now I'm going to give you 10 plays for outer work. Okay, these are more operational in nature. All right, so what do you want? How can I be aligned? How can I make sure that there is alignment between what the client wants and what I offer, the services that I offer. One of the questions was, somebody said, what if the client doesn't know what they want? One technique is you ask them for peak experiences. This is a life coaching technique. Tell me the time when you felt, oh my God, this was the best organization. Something, a moment that captures who you want your organization to be. And tell me your, like, I don't know, the valley experience. I don't know what the technical term is. Like the worst, like you felt, oh my God, I never want to work in such a company for one moment longer than I need to. So you can use open-ended questions to reverse, to figure out what kind of organization your client wants to hire you to help them build and then back into the parameters of your relationship. So I have a chemistry session. Find out, do you have compatible values? Do you have compatible goals? So let's say if some client hires me, wants to hire me and say, Ravi, we want to be agile. We want you to come in. And by the way, this has happened to me. Client comes to me and says, developers are not pulling their weight. I want you to come and expose, put in Jira so that you expose the developers who are slacking off. Another client says, marketing department sucks. I want to use Agile to expose the marketing department. That's why I want to hire you. Somebody says, I want you to create Gantt charts to show that to, for our executive steering committee to show that projects are on time, on scope, on budget. Well, in this, in this chemistry session, I realize, no, I'm not a good fit. This is not what I do. Maybe I can recommend someone if I know, but I'm not, this is not who I am, right? So have a chemistry session. Before you get into a relationship or in the early stages of your relationship, design your alliance. This is a, a term from the coaching industry. In the agile industry, we may call it a working agreement. How will we work together? Design your alliance as early as you can. Who are we going to be? Be mindful. So there will be times when you're deviating from your designed alliance. Sometimes the working agreement is something that you create on Jira or Mural and nobody ever looks at it. It's important to be mindful and see the way we are behaving with each other, with ourselves. How does that compare and contrast to how we said we would behave? How does it compare and contrast to our shared goal, our shared vision? And if that's deviating, let's talk about it. Let's reflect, tune, adapt. One of the things that I am doing is that I am resting myself and replenishing myself, especially when I'm doing things which are draining when you have contentious conversations or even what I'm doing right now, you may not realize it. I'm a painfully shy, socially awkward introvert. And here I am uh, in a conversation with all of you. 
there are things that I did last night to prepare so that I could deliver value to you. And after this conversation is over, there are things that I will do so I can replenish. So I have a pre-game ritual, I have an in-game ritual, and I have a post-game ritual. So you got to be, take fill your inner cup because if your inner cup is empty, you have nothing to offer to the world, to the client. I like to check in with my clients on a weekly cadence. If what I am doing for your company is not important enough for you to talk to me for 30 minutes a week, it's not important for me. My life is too short to mess around with people who don't have 30 minutes to just check in. Design how you're going to get, a, how you will check in with each other. Otherwise, it becomes like a pressure cooker. The resentments accumulate and one day you fire them, they fire you or something happens. Don't allow that. Have a check-in. Have a cadence. Weekly works for me. Something else works for you. Go create it. Articulate what's going on. When your values are stomped, your body will tell you, hey, something not nice happened. I was disrespected. I was devalued. Articulate what's going on. Hey, man, when you said this to me, it did not feel cool. Can we talk about it? If this is not a good time, no problem. Let's find some time but don't allow people to stomp on your values. Somebody's going to get fired. Either you will compromise on your values and you're going to fire the person who you want to be. You're going to fire the person who wants to live a beautiful, joyful life. Or they will fire you. Somebody's going to get fired. Articulate what's going on. When things get bumpy, instead of being triggered like me, this is what my coach told me, from triggerous, be rigorous. When, instead of getting triggered, install a new patch and say, hey, I'm articulate what's going on. Hey, I'm feeling triggered right now. Could we pause? Could we see what, can we talk about what's going on right now? Can we lean into the part of our designed alliance which spoke about turbulence, how we handle difficult situations? This feels like a difficult situation for me. How does it feel like to you? So instead of getting triggered and allowing that frozen part to take over, lean on your designed alliance. Go back to our shared goals, our shared values, our shared alliance. Give yourself permission to leave. Sometimes it's just not a good fit. It doesn't mean you're a bad person, I'm a bad person. It doesn't mean you're a bad company, I'm a bad company. Sometimes it's just not a good fit. At this stage of our life, this song is not for us. This dance is not for us. That's okay. We gave it the best we got. Time to move on. Let's celebrate what worked. Let's grieve what we were hoping would work, but didn't. And let's heal and move on. So this is all I got. I got my 10 problems and my 10 solutions. Talk to me. What resonates? What doesn't? Uh, may I ask one question? Assume here. Yes. Um. Uh, what do you think the difference between a uh, uh, agile coach and a uh, and a scrum master? Because uh, they're highly different, and their audience are also different. And uh, I've seen many places where uh, scrum masters treated an agile co coach when they uh, do not have enough experience, and somewhere they hire an agile coach and ask them to do scrum master work. So they're entirely uh, north or south or east or west type of work. So what's the difference you you have to say where who fits, uh, I mean, where who fits? Thank yes. you. Yes. Thank you, Asim. When I look at how the scrum guide defines the scrum master role, it is the role of a very sophisticated, highly trained organizational development consultant. If you were to implement the Scrum Master the way the creators of the Scrum Guide intended, it is more comparable to what people expect of an Agile coach. But there's a problem in our industry. The problem in our industry is, first, the Scrum Master job the, the salary is so low that it's almost impossible for someone to invest the thousands of dollars it might require to master every bullet point in Scrum Master responsibility. If you look at the Scrum Guide, Scrum Master service to the product owner, Scrum Master service to the team, Scrum Master service to the organization, and you try to develop those capabilities, it's going to cost thousands of dollars and years of your life. So there's a fundamental 
mis disconnect in our industry in how we have interpreted the role of a scrum master. Currently, it is implemented as an entry level position or a very junior position, and it's implemented as a project manager, basically. Therein lies the rub. There's the clash. So I told you Ravi's perspective, but Ravi's perspective is not important. What's important is when you appear for a job interview, ask your hiring manager and people who have the ability to hire or fire you or to promote you, what is your interpretation of the Scrum Master? Um, How will you? Uh, yeah. yes. uh, sorry to say that. Actually, I, I, I can say where I'm currently working, uh, they hate Scrum Master and they never think this is even a role. They say anyone can be a scrum master, and yes. that is where the difference is. That's the reason I uh, I asked what is the agile coach because we just we treat these two names as similar, and both are entirely different. And the audience is also different. Agile coach are more for the managing people to learn what agile is in the first place, and scrum master is focused within the team and how the developers are working. So, I mean, I don't know who is going to uh, fix it. But until this is done, I don't. Uh, all the scrum masters are doomed. Sorry to say that, but somewhere this need to be uh, readjusted. Yeah, and Asim, I'll share something I learned from systems coaching. Everybody gets to be right partially. Everybody gets to be right partially. So there is wisdom uh, in what you're saying. Who pay their right, sir? Uh, Ravi, What's sorry that? to say, but who pay their right? Uh, that is where uh, their power comes from. I'm going to pay a salary, so it's me yeah. who decide yeah. the definition yeah. of it. So what it. others think. It's different story, but if I'm the one who's hiring, it's Correct. my definition what I'm looking for. That is where yeah. the first part I said, if the vision is not clear, yeah. then uh, we just hire the wrong person or we join the wrong company. Got it. Thank you for sharing your perspective. Everybody's right partially. Uh, and there is 2% truth in what everybody has to say. These are a couple of things I learned from systems coaching. So yes, thank you for sharing your perspective. Everybody here has a perspective on, uh, so there's some wisdom. Thank you, Asim. Uh, what other questions, reactions? I think the, the listening to your um, gut about the job <laughs> when you're first talking with the uh, with with the client or with a potential employer is is really important or in those first six weeks or whatever um I have been in situations where if I had listened more closely I would not have gone into the situation to begin with right listen more closely to myself yeah and that's one of the biggest lessons I learned from coactive coaching your body has a wisdom a lot of wisdom. There's a lot of intuition. We have evolved over God knows how many years. And Mother Nature has put those BDD tests, <laughs> behavior-driven development tests in our body. Our body says, hey man, something's just not feeling right. And what happens is, when have I ignored the wisdom of my body, usually out of desperation? Like, oh man, I need money. I need benefits. It's going to be fine. What have I learned? It would have been better if I could get on a time machine and go back in time. What I would have said to myself, dude, you're right. This doesn't feel right. I think it's going to end horribly. But what do you do, man? We need money. So how might we handle this where there is, there might be a perceived conflict between my financial bank account and my ethical bank account and my joyful and my purpose bank account. There's a conflict, right? Financial bank account is saying, dude, I got, I need money, I need benefits. The ethical or the moral bank account is saying, yeah, but I will fill up my bank, replenish my financial bank account, but I will deplete. I'll go bankrupt morally, purposefully. What do we do? I don't know what the answer is. Talk about it. There are parts of you who have the wisdom. Ask your coach, ask your colleagues. And there are times when it was such a horrible misalignment. Uh, I went in, I sacrificed my morals, my ethics, my purpose. And you know what? It did not work out and both bank accounts got depleted. So what I have learned is don't always trust that voice which says out of desperation and scarcity, which is also a frozen part, right? There was a time in my life when I didn't have money to feed my family. 
And apart said, Ravi, don't let this happen to your family ever again. But that that's a valuable voice, but it's not the truth always. So those are the two lessons I've learned. Don't always trust that either of those voices. One voice says, no, no, it's going to be fine. One voice says, dude, if you don't take this job, you're going to be a panhandler. Maybe there's a third way. Explore the third way. What else? Talk to me. So, so Ravi, uh, you know, at the beginning, you are negotiating a relationship. You're, you know, kind of uh, selling, promoting what you can do. And when we were talking about, uh, you know, the person who is walking into a Scrum Master interview and they want a project manager. So, you know, do you ever you know, work with them to see, you know, how they might, you know, shift and meld PM and SM, uh, you know, to have a better understanding of why they've made this sharp turn to PM. And so, you know, can you learn to work better together do I you, would, yeah. yeah, sorry, go ahead, Karen. Um, you know, to understand why they are behaving as they are and, work, you know, shift to a, a more um, productive working relationship. Is that straight PM approach, schedules, meeting, you know, deadlines and ever, is that really going to produce what they want yeah how i would handle that karen is number three in my playbook uh, actually number i would probably do one two and three so the vision they have is hey we want to deliver value to our customers users and investors we want to deliver great releases and we want to we want them to be approximately on time and we don't want to burn the bank so that's their vision and those are the metrics that they care about what's the problem the problem is often in values where they say, our experience has shown that if, if you give these developers autonomy, they misuse the autonomy. And that is why we tried it. But when we, when we realized there was not a project manager holding them accountable, everything went to the dogs. So that is why we don't like it. But we went back to project management because we tried it the other way and it didn't work. Now, I could, if I wanted to, I could ask them, would you be willing, my lived experience has shown me that even if you have a project manager, if the developers don't feel valued and respected, they will find a way to hoodwink the project manager and your releases will still not be on time, on scope, on, on budget. Would you be willing to try a short experiment where I show another way? And we see, and if it works, maybe we continue working together where I'm the scrum master. If it doesn't, I'll either change to project manager or I will go find a different place. I think it's better to articulate what's going on and to be transparent and to verbalize uh, what might be going on. That, that's my way, but you've got to find your own way. Uh, there were, uh, in the interest of time, there are two people. Oscar started saying something in Osni. So if I could briefly, Oscar, if you still have a question or somebody was speaking at the same time as Karen. Would, would right, I was, uh, you You mentioned what I was gonna say, and that sometimes we go in as a scrum master or as a project master, it doesn't really matter what they call us. It's we try and blend in our skill and what we're applying for to meet the company objectives. And if there's a change at the top, we simply, some of the things you said about uh, which bank account are you gonna bankrupt, uh, if it's not illegal, immoral, or unethical, uh, try and use the skills that you've developed to try and work with some of the personalities. Uh, experiment, like you mentioned a little while ago, experiment with different solutions without having any ownership in the outcome and see how you can gain experience during, during the difficult process to better your skill sets because there's always going to be challenges in the future. 
because every time you fix a, every time you learn how to fix a personality issue, God introduces a new one that you haven't solved yet. Yeah. So I, I love what Oscar is saying. I know people who are practicing covert agile because the market has decided. Market is like agile is BS, Scrum is BS. Let's go back. So some people are like, okay, I need a job. And I feel that there's enough compatibility that I can still have the job title of project manager and I can still try to enable accountability. I can enable self-management without using the jargon. So maybe, I don't know. Uh, Joe hey, 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 Robbie, I wanna, wanna give you a three minute warning. We've got uh, questions from Osni and in the chat, we have a question from Brandon. So let's let Osni go next. Okay, Osni, yeah, bottom line, one sentence question, if you can, please. Uh, hi, Javi. Sometimes the client uh, didn't know what he, exactly what he wants. Mm -hmm. Do you have any tips or suggestions when the client is not aware exactly what he wants? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we discussed this earlier in the webinar. Ask for peak experience. What does success look like? What does failure look like? Who do you care about? And I have videos, 10 questions to ask. So offline, if you follow my YouTube channel and my LinkedIn page, and you can also connect with me on LinkedIn, I have 10 questions to help your client dis figure out what they want. And then was it Brandon? Sorry, uh, Joe, who is- Brandon, can you can you come off mute and uh, ask your question? Very briefly, please. Certainly. Hello, um, Ravi and uh, everyone here in the uh, the group. Uh, my question is, basically, I've been to um, some networking groups, kind of uh, one was an HR and tech uh, group, and basically the consensus is that uh, as I'm trying to get established within as a Scrum Master after getting the PSM1, oh, man, you're kind of late. It's, it's like over. It's saturated. Um, and I guess the, uh, the, the where I've had an issue with Basically, every position that I've almost ever seen, except maybe two that were like, you know, elsewhere, uh, requires about three years of experience, six, five. Um, where are the opportunities for the newly certified scrum masters? And what do you recommend? Um, I joined, um, you're saying like, you know, if there's another, Basically, I'm kind of late to this meeting. I didn't see the invite. So another question is, will you also post this replay? I would love to see the full, yeah. your full message. But that kind of is a question. I don't want to ask anything that maybe you've covered. Okay. Replay will be available on the YouTube channel. Brief answer to your question is uh, volunteer if you want to get the first experience or join in another role and start helping a super busy Scrum Master uh, and get the experience. Uh, I don't have, and, and then if you want, we, we can continue the conversation offline uh, on the, post it on LinkedIn and tag Scrum Masters of the Universe. There's a lot of wisdom in this community. All right. Uh, I want to respect the time box. Closing message. Life is short. Go where you're celebrated. Don't stay where you're toler tolerated. That's all I got. I want to hand it over back to the Scrum Masters of the Universe team uh, to wrap up. Thank you so much for the I opportunity. I, there, there is nothing that we could say or do that would be a better wrap up than, than that closing thought that you have left us with. Um, th th this was an outstanding presentation. I think everybody got something from it. I certainly did. And uh, we really thank you for your time, Robbie. E every one of us is, appreciates what you have just done for us. Thank you for the gift of your company. Have a wonderful day.